everything has a beginning. Some of these beginnings can be amazing, like the Big Bang that started everything we know today, while other beginnings are tragic and horrifying. Sadly, the beginning we're talking about today, the start of how film is shot and shown, had one of the worst and most hate-filled beginnings in history. The beginning of the film industry started with a three-hour film called The Birth of a Nation. And today, exactly 106 years later, I thought it was an important topic to discuss, as I firmly believe that we cannot progress further as a society without looking to the past for guidance and lessons on the way things should and should not be conducted. I will warn before diving too deep into the subject that images and topics of today's video can definitely be offensive, and I do not talk about these topics lightly. But this subject deserves to be talked about if only to educate in a form. With all that out of the way, let us begin with our deep dive. The year is 1915. It has been 32 years since the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Lincoln but the Jim Crow laws have been around essentially the entire time and have basically undone everything Lincoln had attempted. Black citizens still have almost no rights and the fight for equality is still going on day in and day out. Southern white Americans are scared that their way of life is nearing its end and that their time at the top of America is surely soon to be over. In comes a young white American filmmaker from Oldham County, Kentucky, who has a vision for a film. At the time, film was silent black and white shorts, typically around 10 minutes, with not much going for them rather than being a technical marvel at the time. If any of the shorts did have a story, they would not be too in depth, as with the limited time it did not give way to building a long arcing story. After making a short film himself in 1908 titled The Fatal Hour, D.W. Griffith continued to make other shorts, until he got inspired by a book by Thomas Dixon called The Klansman, a historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan. Now this novel heavily sided with that of the KKK and the Southern White American, and this film would go on to do exactly that as well. The movie follows two families during the Reconstruction, or the period of time shortly after the Civil War has ended and Lincoln was assassinated. The Stonins from the North and the Camerons from the South are the two families that we follow. The Northern family starts the movie off as abolitionists, or those who opposed slavery at the time, and the Camerons, being a Southern White family, are ex-slave owners and against the abolishment of slavery. Now how a movie frames its characters is important to showing what message the director is trying to convey. If the director attempts to make a certain side seem like the correct side, then that is usually the one that they want and expect the audience to root for. This framing is used in The Birth of a Nation to make the abolishment of slavery seem like a terrible thing and an enemy to the way of life of all white Americans. This is very apparent not only in how every single black character in the movie is portrayed, but also in the ending, and in how the Stonemans from the North start off as abolitionists, but because of a series of events that the director makes certain to happen, they then start to side with the southern white family of the Camerons. Before we get into the absolutely horrifying ending, it is also equally important to talk about the significantly horrifying way black Americans are portrayed in this film. Not only is every single character who is written to be black played by a white actor in blackface, but these characters are also portrayed in a way to make them come off as savages, psychopaths, and lazy, while every white character in the movie is written to come off as leaders, heroic, smart, and caring. This movie does not even attempt to hide its racism, and an entire scene dedicated to showing what it would be like if black Americans were allowed to be senators, showing South Carolina legislators eating fried chicken, smoking cigars, and drinking liquor on the floor. The ending of the movie is what makes the whole thing all the more terrible, as the Ku Klux Klan are shown to be the heroes, and a speech is given about how wonderful the world will be when white Americans are the rulers that they were meant to be all along. And the Stoneman family and Cameron family end up marrying into each other, seeing that the southern white Americans were right all along. And mind you, this was the finished film after several other scenes were removed at the time for being racist. So this version of the movie is supposedly the non-racist version of it. Now a lot of you may ask, why even talk about this piece of shit? 
and I think I should explain. There will be definitely people asking this question. My answer is this. With the climate we find ourselves in today, and racial tensions being extremely high, and a lot of it coming from pure ignorance and an unwant to admit the faults of our past, I think it's important to talk about other racially charged events that happened. This isn't to put fuel in a fire, this is because a lot of these tensions we have today can come from miscommunication and misunderstanding. I'll let writer, director, and professor Spike Lee explain it in better terms. Love the film. I Thank mean, you. so it's so important. We know that. You made a lot of film references, and I want to talk in particularly about Birth of a Nation, mm. because it's a film that's recognized for the filmmaking technique that it introduced. Right. But is it irresponsible? David Griffith. Exactly. Right. But is it irresponsible for us to recognize films for their technique in spite of the negative representations that they portray? Well, that's a very interesting question because this is personal for me. I'm a graduate of NYU Film School, mm. and I, th it's a three-year program. The first year, my professor screened the film, Birth of a Nation, and they talked about all the cinematic innovations D.D. Griffin have come up with, this and that, but they did not they left out everything that had to do with the social yeah. impact of the film. That this film regenerized the Klan. The Klan was dormant, it was dead. And it brought about a rebirth, and therefore, because of rebirth, the, there was a rebirth of the Klan, it led directly to black people being lynched, strung up, castrated, and just murdered. But that was never discussed. Mm. So, to further answer your question, I have no problem with Birth of a Nation being screened, but let's put it in context. I have mm. no problem. I, this, Huckleberry Finn should be in schools. Mm. Uh, to Kill a Button Knockenberg should be, I mean, just because of the word N word, I mean. Yeah. But let's discuss it. Let's not say because, uh, you know, can't be seen, can't go in a library. I, I think that stuff is, is, is foolish. As you can see, this film has been used to talk about how innovative and pioneering the film was. But everyone tries to avoid the social aspects, because for some it's awkward, or it's too taboo, or they just don't care. These are discussions we need to have to stay educated and stay away from acting like this stuff didn't happen. Acknowledging the existence of this stuff and talking about it. Maybe not for you, but for those who need to know that this stuff doesn't go unnoticed. A major misunderstanding I see way too often from a certain side is the belief that, oh, slavery's been over for hundreds of years. No one today was even alive back then. What's everyone so mad about? Why is this coming from nowhere? And the main answers are quite simple. First off, like this movie can clearly show, slavery isn't the only terrible thing that has been done to minorities in this country, and in our history. And there are even more recent events than just this movie that came out 106 years ago. Events, like this awfully racist movie, do need to be talked about, and pointed out. Because when we talk about these things and get closer and closer to equating these events to the current day, it paints a very clear picture as to why people are mad in this country, and why racial disparity is not dead. It's not something that just happened one time. We put a band-aid on it and called it good, and racists have an act up since. We never really reckoned with it. We have a Holocaust museum in Washington, D.C. because the world forced Germany to answer to the atrocities that they subjected Jewish people to and millions of other ethnic groups during World War II and it serves as a permanent reminder of that fact. Meanwhile, we don't have a national museum dedicated to exploring slavery because America keeps trying to sweep it under the proverbial rug and insists that generations of African Americans couldn't possibly be affected by slavery in the long term, even though the exact opposite is proven true. We can't keep ignoring and mythologizing slavery just because facing it head on makes us feel bad. Part of the healing comes from facing it. This stuff is ingrained in American culture. Nothing has been safe from the far reaches of racism and power. Talking about horrible things, like the subject of today's video, is how we all get educated on the horrible shit that yes, not a single one of us alive today partook in, but is something that every one of us today should be able to come together and talk about, and ensure that every other person in our society today would never allow this to go unchecked, and then actually make true on that promise. I believe that the last four years, and especially 2020, have shown each and every American, what silence and forgetting the past can do, as a lot of what is in this movie can be seen ever so visibly in today's America. Turning a blind eye to this kind of awfulness doesn't make it go away. 
Knowing where we come from so that we can move forward and progress into an even better world is everything. It's why history is even a subject in school. It's why we write down everything significant that happens in the books and online, so that it may never be forgotten, and we can learn from it. It's the same reason we talk about the Holocaust, because there are those out there who try to claim it didn't happen. It's why we talk about slavery, so we can make sure that something like that never happens again. And it is why I felt the need to shed light on this horrific film, because it wasn't just some nothing racist film made in 1915. This film would go on to be used by the KKK to recruit new members even as recently as the 1970s by the now KKK leader David Duke. This movie would end up being the first movie ever screened at the White House by then President Woodrow Wilson. This movie can clearly show every single American who is either too ignorant or insensitive why blackface is such a terrible thing to do and isn't just something that people get angry about, as it was a tool used to keep an entire race of people down. This would become the highest grossing movie of its time and the first quote unquote blockbuster. This is important shit for all of us to know and to hate together. It isn't brave to say racism is bad, just as it isn't brave to say Hitler was a horrible human being but it is important to do, and there really are people out there who think otherwise. It is far too important to know that there are more good people than bad, that more people agree for the right thing than the wrong. Saying things shouldn't be forgotten does not by any means mean that things should be revered or admired. Having a statue of a known racist who owns slaves is not okay. However, having a history book talk about this person and let people know what he did and that he owned slaves is important. Waving a flag that stood for the message of slavery is not okay. However, knowing what that flag stood for so that we do not wave it and be insensitive to an entire race of people is important. We do have tension, we do have feelings, and we do have emotions. Knowing about this film and how abhorrently awful it was, and yet how many Americans agreed with and went to see the film at the time, is important to know. However, having it be in a top 100 films of all time list in the year 1998 is not. History is very important to talk about, and be remembered, so that we can never repeat the bad shit, and can learn from others' mistakes, instead of making our own. But admiring the horrible things of the past should be shot down at every junction, and should not be accepted. That is why I felt the need to make this video, because this movie was 106 years ago, and while we can say that America is very different today than it was back then, we can also easily acknowledge that we have so much more work to do to get us even further away from what that version of America looked like. Now with this last segment, I am by no means saying that the director D.W. Griffith had some secret hidden intention with this movie. It is quite clear where the director stands on this subject, and what he was attempting to do with this film. This film does, however, remind me of other films and some songs that give off a message that is horrible, even though the artist's intention behind it did not mean it to be that way. For instance, a movie that dropped on Netflix in 2020 that had everyone talking, Cuties. This movie doesn't come to mind because it has a similar message or anything like that. It comes to mind because of how films and other forms of art can be used in very bad contexts, sometimes even in ways the artist did not intend. For instance, Cuties was attempting to make a commentary on how young girls can be sexualized and how terrible that can be. And I won't get too far into detail about the director's intentions of this film, but I will however say that the intentions don't matter if your film can be used the wrong way. No matter what the director intended to make, what the final product is is essentially giving in to everything that the artist is attempting to say they're against. The artist is trying to say, hey, this is really bad, but the film ends up becoming the very thing that you're scrutinizing. The only reason this reminds me of Birth of a Nation is because this movie was also weaponized and used in a terrible way. The Birth of a Nation not only became the most watched movie at the time, even with agencies such as the NAACP attempting to get it banned from theaters, but it also ended up giving a huge boost to the then dying KKK, and as said earlier was used as a recruitment device. This is why it is so very important to pay attention to movies, music, and any art in general and to be educated on how evil something can be. That is why I had a few reservations with making this video, knowing that if I didn't frame my argument correctly, it could fuel the flames I was attempting to address. And I do feel as though I have made something that states very clearly where I stand, and where I believe every person who watches this should stand, 
I don't think I've done a perfect job, as no one can. But I do hope that this video brings awareness to things such as this, and paints a picture for those who had no knowledge something like this existed. I hope we can use the knowledge of the past, as horrible and disgusting as it may be, to progress forward and become even better human beings. The truth is that I love every single one of you beautiful people, and moving forward I will continue to make content that starts conversations, adult conversations, about topics like this that shouldn't be avoided and should be happening between everyone to get a clear picture on how we should all strive not to be. Negative influences are just as important to progress as positive ones, and hopefully you can let this film and everything it stood for be an influence in your life to what you shouldn't strive to be. Now before you go, I would like to end on a positive note. And seeing as how it is Black History Month, I would like to shine light on some of the amazing accomplishments achieved in the film industry. Herbie Hancock became the first black composer to win an Oscar for his work on the 1986 film called Round Midnight. Jordan Peele became the first black screenwriter to win an Oscar for his script for the movie Get Out in 2017. And Roger Ross Williams became the first black director to win an Oscar for his documentary Music by Prudence. Thanks again to all of you for watching, and I hope you learned something today.